the Columbia Broadcasting System presents One World Flight. Historic flight around the world by Wendell Wilkie during the dark days of the war plays into phrase one world as a beacon for liberty-loving people everywhere. The Common Council for American Unity and the Wilkie Memorial of Freedom House have therefore decided to establish a one world award patterned after Mr. Wilkie's globe-circling trip as a dramatic reminder of his dream for all mankind. It really began one night last February in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. Some friends of the late Wendell Wilkie had gathered on the anniversary of his birthday to honor his memory. The former mayor of New York, Fiorello H. LaGuardia, was chairman of that occasion. Tonight, Mr. LaGuardia, speaking from the living room of his home in New York City, reenacts his role on that evening. After announcing the establishment of the award, Mr. LaGuardia paused and continues. The Common Council for American Unity and the Wilkie Memorial of Freedom House have agreed that this award be given to recognize and encourage contributions to the concept of one world, particularly in the field of mass communications such as press, radio, and moving pictures. The board of directors the two organizations have reached a decision as to the winner of this year's award. On their behalf, I have the pleasure of announcing that it is presented to Norman Corwin. <laughs> This is Norman Corwin. From the voice of Mr. LaGuardia at the dinner to LaGuardia Field took four months of preparation. Passport, visas, reservations, selection of route, inoculations, the building and testing of recording equipment, and a hundred personal requirements. And then in the middle of June, we set out. There were farewells, the boarding of the plane, the motors revving up. And out of the window, as we taxied down the field, a last glimpse of a cluster of friendly faces and waving hands. The day was bright and clear, the ship stainless and glistening. The only dark thing I recall about the moment were the headlines in the morning papers concerning the state of the peace. We took off. had no time to look at the country beneath us. Our job had already begun. The wire recorder was rigged up for it in the navigator station, and I tested it to see how it worked on the ship's electrical system. Collaborating with me in the test was a young passenger, nine years old, named Lionel Salem, who had wandered up and pumped me with questions about the machine. I showed him how it worked. Tell me, Lionel, uh, is this your first trip? Yes. Uh, you've done no flying at all? No, sir. Well, uh, how do you like it? Fine. And where are you going? Uh, to uh, Brussels, and there we're going to take a train to Paris. What are you going to Paris for? Because that's where I was born. We're going, we're coming back in September. I see. You're not going to attend the peace conference, is that it? Nope. Would you like to attend the peace conference? Nope. Do you think you could contribute something to the peace conference if you attended it? Nope. Well, that's a frank answer. 
In the time it takes to travel by train from New York to Albany, this Pan American clipper was flying over the lakes of Nova Scotia. In another hour, we landed at Gander, Newfoundland for fuel and lunch, and then we were off due east to cross the Atlantic. As the day wore on, we sighted icebergs 12,000 feet below us, looking like white flecks on the blue surface of the ocean. I struck up a conversation with a pleasant-faced, gray-haired man who turned out to be Vladimir Hoban, then Czechoslovak ambassador to the United States. He was on his way home to Prague. We talked about Czechoslovakia and the war and about Wendell Wilkie, whom he had known. After a while, I switched on the recording machine and we passed the microphone between us. Mr. Hoban disposed of my biggest question very simply when I asked what he thought the best means of promoting understanding between nations and tolerance among peoples. Well, that's a pretty big question, which, anyway, can be answered by two words. If the people will understand them, that is decency and honesty. I said that one of the objectives of my trip was to find out whether decency and honesty were understood around the world, whether the average man had a sense of moral principle and could define it. The ambassador urged me out of curiosity to make a test at random right here aboard the clipper by stopping the first person to go by and drawing him into conversation on the subject. The first person to go by was a stewardess who was going by all the time in the course of her duties. She was Miss Romaine Cahoon home in Forest Hills, Long Island. She warmed up to the subject quickly, and at one point, I confronted her with this. I said that for some time, excellent codes of decency and honesty, such as the Ten Commandments and various bills of rights, had been in practice. But I said they had been only roughly adhered to, and I suggested that perhaps something new in the way of principles might have to be added. Well, she disagreed with me. I uh, disagree with you in saying you think something new has to be added. I think that any uh, principle that is perfect in its inception doesn't have to be improved. I think it should be practiced more, but I don't think it's possible to improve it. Uh, this is my pet theory, perhaps I'm wrong, but it seems to me that all wars and uh, international disagreements are results of, uh, shall we say, uh, magnified minor uh, quarrels and squabbles. I think it's most important that we... Uh, shall I say, do our spring house cleaning at home before we try uh, cleaning our neighbor's yard. A signal light flashed over the door to the cockpit and Miss Cahoon went back to work. The plane roared along toward Ireland. As the night lengthened, the passengers sagged in their seats and slept. But Bland and I sat up talking on the chance that there might be something about the plane's routine to record so that those of you who have never crossed an ocean by air might tonight hear what it's like. There wasn't much, actually. 700 miles off the coast of Newfoundland, we recorded the voice of weather ship Charlie, a small craft flying in a wide circle 15,000 feet below us. Charlie is one of several ships of various registries assigned by international agreement to stay far out at sea and do nothing but supply weather information to transatlantic planes. Chalk up one for quiet and unspectacular accord among the nations. Charlie's voice, as it came over the radio, was fuzzy, but... Anyway, here's a moment of how he sounded when he called Clipper 60 with a weather report. Clipper 60, Clipper 60, weather ship Charlie, weather ship Charlie. Visibility of weather, 12 miles, 12 miles. Temperature, 29. We left Charlie behind in the static and flew on. There were only a couple of hours of full darkness because summer twilight lingers in the northern latitudes, and besides, we were racing to meet the sun. Dawn was edging over the horizon just as we began to descend to Ireland. I stood, microphone in hand, behind Captain Smith in the pilot's seat and described, somewhat inelegantly, what I saw. My tone, you'll notice, is fairly dismal, and that's because I was getting tired. You'll hear the captain command the lowering of flaps, meaning wing flaps, which act as brakes on the speed of the plane. Uh, heading down to the soil of Ireland. 80% flaps. 80% flaps. Coming down. 80% flap coming down. On that go! I now see straight ahead of me a parallel row of lights. And a bowling alley lit up. We are heading right for it. There is mist all around it. Darkness. We're heading straight down the alley. 100% flap. 
flap. 100% flap coming down. The light's way off in the distance. Probably the town of Rhinonea. Rhinonea. Rhinonea, I'm corrected. Shame on me. I've been there before, too. It was raining in Rhinonea, formerly Rhinonea, when we landed. I disembarked, we ate breakfast at the airport, and took off again. Ireland drifted under us, then the Irish Sea, then the mountains of Wales, then the tight green Thames country, and at last we landed at Heathrow outside London. Behind us was the first leg of the One World Flight. New York, Newfoundland, the Atlantic, Ireland, England, all in slightly under 12 hours. London was different than when I had seen it last, and the difference was all to the good. There were no barrage balloons overhead, no signs pointing to air raid shelters, no fresh bomb ruins. It was early on a Sunday morning, and as we drove in from the airport, the city was still sleeping and the streets were bare. Hyde Park, in the heart of the town, was quiet as a country dell. Peace, I thought, as I looked about this corner of the world so lately embattled, is pretty wonderful. The British had fought hard for it, and on London, it looked especially becoming. The morning of our arrival was warm and fair, one of the few legitimately summery days in any English year. By night, it was raining, and even indoors, it was chilly. I found people were eating the same cold salmon and Brussels sprouts and generally dull food in the same cold rooms, as during the darkest days of 1942. But they seemed fairly cheerful about it. It was now 13 months since the end of the war in Europe, but England was still feeling the pinch. That's the way it is with modern war. There are very few spoils left to the victor. The morning after I arrived, the government announced that the milk ration would be cut, the soap ration reduced by one-seventh, and that rationing of bread would begin soon. I asked a housewife about conditions, a middle-class housewife named Hill, and she was almost gay in her seeming unconcern. She said she was getting one egg every two months and one pint of milk per week. I asked her about the availability and variety of other foods and how the fare compared to the days of the war. She answered, Well, I think it's a little better now. For instance, last week I got two pounds of strawberries, but that's because I have dealt with the same man for eight years. He knows me very well. He goes into the back of the shop and comes out with his finger up to his mouth saying, shush, and he puts something in the bottom of my bag and I can't ask what it is. Same applies to tomatoes, cucumbers, new potatoes, and peas. What, did you ask what the price was? Oh, heavens, no, I wouldn't dare to. But what was the price? I don't know. You mean you will be billed at the end of the month? I shall be billed at the end of the month and I shall put up my hands in horror and ask for another box. How long has it been since you had a meal at home, which was um, a really... Um, Filling meal so that you felt that you might perhaps have to stagger away from the table. Christmas. Last Christmas. Mm. Uh, once a year, then. Well, once a year, yes, but then I, I wangled that. You see, I knew somebody in the country who knew a farmer who sent a goose, and we ate it in one day. Three of us. Twenty-pound goose. Ordinarily, in any season other than Christmas, that would be a rash and impulsive, headstrong... Oh, it certainly would, but you can't get them. This housewife was not a customer of the black market, but she had enough money to be prudent and not ask the price of strawberries. But for the poor in England, as everywhere else, including the United States, there is never a grocer who says shush and puts something in the bottom of the bag. There is never the 20-pound goose, not even on Christmas. Beginning in London, clear around the world to Los Angeles, I was to find very few cities where food for the majority of people was ample and varied and cheap. Black markets plenty for those who could pay, but for the low-income bracket it was the old routine, ranging from not quite enough to eat to sheer starvation, as in China and parts of India. But other things besides food were on the minds of the English people and their government at this particular moment, and I set out to learn what a few of them were. I made an appointment to record the Prime Minister, Clement Attlee, at number 10 Downing Street. 
He received me in the cabinet room where so many decisions fateful to the world have been made in recent history. He was wearing a cardigan sweater, and he puffed a pipe with an expression of deep absorption. It had been previously made clear to me that the Prime Minister had never been recorded in this manner, that, like the President of the United States, he always spoke for radio purposes over several networks, never for an individual one. But in deference to the auspices of the One World Award, an exception was being made in this case. You may remember that not too long ago, tension was high in international relations, and against this background, I asked Mr. Attlee whether he felt there were any indications that the concept of One World could make headway. I don't think we ought to get despondent too early or too easily because of the international difficulties and the suspicions of opposing interests. After all, we're trying to clear up after the greatest war in history. And you can't expect all the problems of that war and a good many left over from the First World War to disappear overnight. The trouble is, of course, all the differences make the dramatic news. But I think it's worthwhile paying some attention to the area's activity in which there's agreement. Have you any ideas on what I might term the techniques of peace? Well, I think one important thing is, first of all, to realize uh, that uh, there's something quite different in uh, peace from uh, no more war. If you continually think of the prevention of war, you don't get very far. You've got to think of positive peace. And that really depends on a greater understanding, not just between governments, but between people. Not just about policies, but about ways of life. And uh, for that, I think, first of all, you want far greater information. And then a realization we're all engaged on a constructive enterprise as partners and neighbors. Now, that enterprise is quite as exciting and quite as adventurous as anything you ever had in war. We're all engaged in the great adventure of democracy, which is a tremendous adventure. And uh, every nation's got its special contribution to make. And uh, if we consider what contribution we can make, rather than uh, looking at what we think some other nation is not making, I think we should do better. This, then, was a recommendation for self-examination, for self-searching, for beginnings at home. On another level, it was the same thing the young stewardess had said in the cabin of the clipper. I think it's most important that we, uh, shall I say, do our spring house cleaning at home before we try... Uh cleaning our neighbor's And in my very next interview in London, this same principal got another vote. I looked up the playwright and novelist J.B. Priestley, author of The Good Companions and other works well known outside his own country. He had just returned from a trip to Scandinavia and the Soviet Union, and I wanted to sound him out on his feelings about the world. He fell in gladly, addressing the microphone as an old friend. In the first place, he said he was bored with all this former diddling about passports and customs that he wished the nations would hurry up and return to the old days when they didn't bother with that sort of thing. Then he went on to explain what he thought was wrong with the world, and he used psychological terms to state his position. There is a great danger now, I think, of what the psychologists call projecting the contents of the unconscious onto the outside world. In other words, instead of trying to understand the other people, you project the contents of the unconscious that you don't like, with the evil bit of yourself, onto these other people, as if they were a, a blank wall and you were throwing a lantern slide on. And there's a great deal of that happening. I mean, I think one reason why the, the victorious allies began drawing away from each other the minute their common enemy was defeated, their kind of common enemy, was that they were still busy they were still in the same psychological mood. And they had to find... They had to invent enemies, almost. I saw the drift of his remarks, and it, it too, was a call for self-examination, to find out whether there was some evil bit of ourselves which we were pinning on someone else and then throwing stones at the result. 
Somehow, the British seemed in a mood to analyze themselves all over the place, to question their own policies at home and abroad. It was not long after I left England that a sweeping investigation of the British press was demanded in Parliament. In my travels about London, I ran into a cabbie who wondered whether Palestine couldn't be made a healthier place for the British Tommy by smarter handling of the problem on the part of the government, though he didn't specify what he meant by smarter handling. I talked with a pub owner who wondered whether Britain, Britain's merchant sailors weren't getting a raw deal. And then there was the writer Westerby, who wondered whether his craft had been entirely honorable over the last generation. For the last 25 years, what have we been doing? We've just been working, as I wrote in a book once, we've all been working under the light of the red lamp. We sell an idea, we sell a conscience, we sell what we're supposed to say, too many of us, for the money we could pick up playing to what we thought was the public fancy and not taking a chance and not putting forward an idea which might be unpopular. Because if you're a professional writer, you've got to think about your pocket. Well, it's about time professional writers thought more about their conscience and try to say things to each other and to other people instead of saying things to the publisher and ultimately to the bank manager. I left Westerby for an interview with Lord Van Sittart, conservative member of parliament and an outspoken critic of allied policy in Germany and of Russian policy everywhere. We discussed both questions, and he was pessimistic about the way things were going in the United Nations. Most of the trouble he blamed on Russia. The only way to treat problems as a whole, he said, was by, quote, revision of the general tendency of Russian policies at the moment, unquote. He was critical of Anglo-American information. His comment is obscured in the recording by a poor power supply, but if you listen very closely, I think you'll be able to make it out. I've always thought that our respective governments might have done more to enlighten public opinion than they did, and if they had done so, they would have found it much less difficult to frame a policy. On the other hand, he said that the expression, the Iron Curtain, was, quote, rather exaggerated inasmuch as journalists can penetrate in Eastern Europe and move about fairly freely, unquote. But the greatest stress on freedom of information came from the next man I interviewed, Mr. Philip Noel Baker, then Minister of State. He argued that not only must information be free, but uncolored, that it must not be distorted to fit a publisher's or broadcaster's personal political prejudice or angled in the interests of sensationalism and circulation. Our meeting was in the Foreign Office. Mr. Noel Baker, who has since then become Britain's Minister of Air, was outspoken about manipulators of public opinion, to whom he referred as publicity magnates. I confess that I think most publicity magnates are falling into a very grave error when they believe, as they do believe now, that only quarrels and disputes are new. In our economic and social council work in New York last week, we had many discussions in which every single speech made, whether it was by the United States delegate or by the United Kingdom delegate or by the Soviet delegate or the Ukraine or Yugoslavia, was in fact a constructive speech intended to help towards a long-term result. And yet, nearly all the newspapers came out day by day, if they mentioned the thing at all, with a heading, Anglo-Soviet Clash. And there was indeed a point on which we were not in agreement with the Soviet Union. But taking the discussion as a whole, it was an utter misrepresentation of the facts. In the next sentence, Mr. Noel Baker uses a Latin phrase which you might have trouble catching. Magna est veritas, the truth is great. I don't mind misrepresentation. Magna est veritas, and in the end, it, it will prevail. But what I do mind is the utter stupidity of the publicity magazines in thinking that the people want to go on reading about clashes after eight years of appeasement and six years of total war. They want to hear about constructive effort. I talked with other people a bus driver who was worried about the loan from America, which hadn't yet come through, two factory workers who thought Russia was still a pal of theirs, a couple of radio men who thought radio was the only instrument that could make one world, a Gentile doctor who thought that the Jews of Europe were being dreadfully treated, 
I looked around the city for signs of one world in the theater. There was a Swedish psychological drama playing at the Academy, French light opera at the Adelphia, Italian heavy opera at the Cambridge, an American play, The Hasty Heart, at the Aldrich, and the Russian Brothers Karamazov at the Lyric. I heard the uh, a Brazilian samba coming from a loudspeaker of a record shop along Charing Cross Road somewhere. It was the last Brazilian tune I was to hear until I got to China. I left London taking with me the same impression of a strong and confident British people that I had carried away when I was last among them during a dark period of the war. Although they were questioning and self-critical, they were not, by and large, apprehensive about the peace. They understood that it was going to take not months, but years to put the world together after the staggering disruptions of the war. They were not inventing enemies, though some of them, like Mr. Noel Baker, intimated that certain segments of their press were only too busy doing this for them. Whether or not their leaders were wisely guiding them through the complex problems affecting Palestine, Greece, India, and the world in general, they disagreed. I knew for certain, or thought I knew, that the ideal of one world would not be hard to sell to the tough, war-weary, ration-weary people of England who could use more fuel, better clothes, a lot more varied diet, and a great many more friends. On a gray morning, I drove to Northolt and boarded the Paris plane. It took off into a stormy sky, and it flew at low level over the poetic country of Kent and Sussex. We sat on cushioned seats and rode easily through the same skies that had been the greatest aerial battlefield in history. This way had come the Luftwaffe and gone back broken. This way had come the night raiders and the buzz bombs and the V-rockets. This way had gone the Stirlings and Lancasters the Liberators and B-17s. We crossed the coast at Bexhill and headed for France. The weather over the channel was clear and the water sparkled with a million facets of reflected sunlight. I looked out of the window at the bright strait and found myself thinking of Paddy Finnegan, the Irish ace in the RAF, who died down there one afternoon. There were thousands of fighters like Paddy lying beyond view with the English Channel across their chests. I thought of them, and I thought of the many others as we made our landfall on the French town of bitter memory by name Dieppe. And I wondered whether, if those boys could talk, they would go for the idea of a world made one. been listening to Norman Corwin, CBS playwright producer, and first winner of the One World Award in the second of a series of Columbia broadcasts entitled One World Flight, the authentic record of his 37,000-mile global trip. Heard on the first part of the program was Fiorello H. LaGuardia. All voices except those of Mr. Corwin and Mr. LaGuardia, who was heard earlier in the program, were recorded. In tonight's broadcast, the original musical score was composed and conducted by Alexander Semler. Guy Della Chapa was associate director. This is Lee Vines, and this is CBS the Columbia Broadcasting System.